Hello students, I'm your faculty Mr. Rahim. Today I'm teaching you a chapter from uh, zoology. This is uh, seventh chapter from second PU. It is evolution. So let us begin our study with what is meaning of evolution or evolutionary biology. So evolutionary biology or evolution means study of history of life forms on earth so let us uh, understand that each and every organism which is uh, found on earth has its own history okay so how it has uh, evolved from which organism it evolved when it evolved to what stages did it go so that is what we call as history of life forms of an organism now for example if you take human beings we all know that uh, humans have evolved from their great great ancestor chimpanzees or monkeys so over a period of time human beings have uh, gone through various stages and then finally they have become what they are today the modern man so study of uh, such different stages of how an organism evolves over a period of time is uh, what is called as evolution or evolutionary biology now the life forms that are found on earth the life itself you know it doesn't come in a standard size shape and color for example if you see here in the slide you have uh, vertebrates like this tiger you have invertebrates like this butterfly you have animals which walk on land you have animals which fly in the sky like this owl and they are also come in different uh, uh, sizes and colors so what i want to say is there is no standard size shape color uh for the living organisms that is there is a variety in living organisms now how to explain why life doesn't come in a standard uh, size and shape or why there is a biodiversity so if you take butterflies a common invertebrate around us in butterflies itself we have so many different species of butterflies now why butterfly can't be of just one type why they have to be of you know so many different uh, types and varieties what makes nature to produce so many different types of uh, uh, species of just a particular uh, you know invertebrate which is butterfly here so the answer to this uh, question also lies in the study of evolution so it is believed that evolution is uh, responsible for this uh, vast variety of living organisms around us which could be either plants or animals so without evolution it would have not been possible for life to uh, take these so many different sizes shapes color etc so the biodiversity which is known as the vast variety of flora and fauna around us so that is what is the definition of biodiversity the vast variety of flora and fauna around us so this biodiversity is uh, one of the results of evolution now this evolution was uh, discovered by a person whom we call as the father of evolution he is none other than charles darwin so he is not the only one to have come up with the idea of evolution but since he popularized it in his book called the origin of species so the credit uh, uh, for evolution the discovery and for the work on evolution mostly goes to this man here who is 
Charles Darwin known as father of evolution. Now, how did uh, Charles Darwin discover evolution? So that's a completely different story, which we'll try to cover in the next classes. But let me tell you a few interesting things about uh, Charles Darwin. So when Darwin was very young, in the year uh, 1831, he set on a voyage on a ship called HMS Beagle. So this is the name of the ship, HMS Beagle. So on this voyage, on HMS Beagle, it took him to various places around the world. So this is the map uh, uh, which tells us the, the route taken by HMS Beagle on its voyage. Now, while on this voyage, the ship also came to a place here, which is a group of islands called Galapagos Islands. So when Darwin arrived at these Galapagos Islands, he saw something interesting there, which made him uh, to think about the process of evolution and discover evolution. So what did he see there in the Galapagos Islands? All that we'll see in the future classes. But today's class is just an introductory class to evolution and we'll understand how life originated on planet Earth. Now, this discovery of evolution by Charles Darwin, you know, it became one of the milestones in the study of living organisms or biology. So it became such an important milestone that, uh, you know, we can compare it with the discovery of uh, gravity by Newton. So just like gravity, it was there all the time, but nobody could uh, discover it. Newton, because of his uh, keen observation, he was the first to discover gravity. Now, similar to Newton, even evolution was discovered by Charles Darwin. Evolution, it was going on. It was, it was happening all the time. But for the first time, it was uh, discovered by Charles Darwin. So you can compare the discovery of evolution with uh, one of the important discoveries, classical discoveries of uh, uh, physics, which is uh, discovery of gravity by Newton. It is such an important discovery in the field of biology. Now, in evolution, organisms gradually change with time. So the word gradual here is very important or slowly is very important. So how slowly is this, how slowly does this evolution take place? So evolution takes place really slowly, gradually. So nobody can see the evolution, the effects of evolution until, uh, you know, they survive for many millions of years. Because just to see even a slightest change in the organism, one organism converting into the other organism, like here these monkeys transforming into man over a period of time, it takes millions of years. So since nobody was, uh, you know, capable of living for so long, and since there was no audience, if I have to say, you know, which can survive to see these uh, effects for such a long time, you know, that is what made the discovery of uh, uh, evolution so important, which uh, uh, made it also difficult to observe. Now, before we try to understand the process of evolution, a student is supposed to know certain uh, prerequisites about how universe formed, that is how universe came into existence, and then how Earth originated. So the origin of universe and the origin of Earth, you know, these uh, uh, one must know before they try to understand how life originated on Earth and then how this life became so diverse because of evolution. So let us try to understand how universe evolved first. So whatever I have told you the prerequisites to understand uh, how life became so diverse, that is uh, the origin of earth or first origin of universe. then origin of earth so all that comes or all that is a part of uh, an, a type of evolution called chemical evolution so there are two types of evolutions chemical evolution and organic evolution so chemical evolution deals with the origin of universe origin of earth and at the same time formation of simple molecules 
like amino acids sugars nucleotides etc and also the polymerization of these simple molecules to form complex molecules so all this is a part of a type of evolution called chemical evolution so chemical evolution deals with all of these now what does organic evolution deal with so organic evolution deals with how these uh, complex molecules which are formed during chemical evolution gave rise to primitive cell that is the first cell and then how did this single celled organism gave rise to multicellular organisms and then how did these uh, initially few organisms they evolved and gave rise to all these present day different types or species of plants and animals which is called diversification of living organisms so what i have written here on the right hand side formation of the primitive cell which is the first uh, unicellular organism and then how did this first formed unicellular organism gave rise to multicellular organisms and then how these multicellular organisms evolved into all these present day plants and animal species is what is part of the second type of evolution which is called organic evolution so organic evolution mainly deals with the diversification of life along with the origin of life origin and diversification of life is dealt by the organic evolution whereas how uh, initially the simple molecules formed on earth so that is part of the other type of evolution which is chemical evolution so these are the two types of evolutions then that one can come across now let us uh, try to understand how did universe originate let us know about the origin of the universe now universe is believed to have begun with a loud explosion what we call as big bang so there a long long time ago you know about uh, how long did universe form the universe formed about 20 billion years ago so about 20 billion years ago it is believed that a loud explosion took place which is what we call as the big bang and because of that big bang there were series of events which led to the formation of universe now what are the series of events we'll make a list of these series of events here so first there was singular explosion this singular explosion the singular explosion created lot of heat or energy so we also write heat as a source of energy so this energy got converted into matter you know this is the relationship which was uh, given by albert einstein e is equal to mc square so that gives us a relationship between energy and matter so now this matter initially was in the form of hot gases so as the universe expanded so because of explosion the universe was expanding and as it expanded it cooled 
so the hot, hot gases also began to cool and they started to condense so they condensed to form what we known as heavenly bodies so heavenly bodies were rock like structures which were formed due to condensation of the gases as the universe began to cool down so these heavenly bodies they started to collide with each other since any matter has uh, the power to attract uh, other matter you know which is what we call as gravity so because of uh, gravity these heavenly bodies they started to get attracted towards the larger bodies and they started to collide with them and that led to the formation of protoplanets and later on these protoplanets evolved into planets solar systems galaxies and galaxies are the uh, ultimately you know cluster of galaxies is what we call as universe so let us see what is there in the universe so universe is made up of galaxies so galaxies are made up of many solar systems solar systems are made up of planets and satellites so this is how one of the planet on which uh, life is found which is our planet earth was also formed now what gave scientists an idea that a uh, loud explosion called big bang took place uh, uh, 20 billion years ago so the story is like this a scientist called edwin hubble edwin hubble was observing uh, you know two particular stars he was an uh, astronomer so he was observing two particular stars and he found that these two particular stars were constantly moving apart from each other so he made his observations over a period of time and then he again started to observe other stars and he also found that they are also constantly moving apart from each other so that concept of expansion of universe was uh, taken by a uh, scientist called a russian scientist called ebe lymetry so ebe lymetry was the one who proposed this uh, big bang theory so big bang theory was proposed by ebe lymetry so this is in the year 1931 now hubble made his observations in the year 1929 so edwin hubble so he found that the celestial bodies are constantly moving apart from each other you know which became uh, uh, the basis for ebe lymetry to propose big bang theory you know that discovery was made by edwin hubble in the year 1929 now what other evidences do we have that uh, universe is really expanding so if you see the temperature of universe is coming down with time so that also tells us that initially why it was re really so hot was maybe because of uh, this big explosion called big bang and as time passed you know the heat of the uh, explosion you know came down so things like that the celestial bodies are constantly moving apart from each other and also uh, the fact that the universe is cooling down with the time points uh, to the fact that a loud explosion called big bang would have taken place many many years ago so that is believed to be about 20 billion years ago so the answer to the question when did big bang occur
so the big bang occurred about 20 billion years ago so that is the estimated time when big bang would have taken place so that is also the time when the universe began to originate so origin of universe or whether it is when did big bang take place so the answer for both these questions is same about 20 million years ago now how did life originate on earth now let us come to the origin of life now here is a very important statement the origin of life is a unique event in the history of universe so nothing is as interesting as the origin of life in the history of universe so why it is so interesting is you know life is not found anywhere else we have so far not found life in any other part of the universe so although we are trying hard so, so far we have not been able to see any life in any part of the universe. So, so far earth is the only place that we know where life exists. So, that makes the origin of life a very unique and interesting event in the entire history of origin of universe. Now, what do we call the study of uh, life in outer space? study of life in outer space or the people who look for life or signs of life on other planets so what they do is it is called as astrobiology so study of life on other planets or in space is known as astro biology so so far astrobiologists have not found life other than uh, you know anywhere else in the universe other than the earth and the origin of life is a very important and unique feature a unique event in the entire history of the universe now how did this life originate on earth now there is a debate whether life really originated or it was a transferred from some part of the universe onto the earth. We really do not know. So how did life either originate or it got transferred from some part of the universe onto the earth. But nonetheless, there are theories which try to explain the origin of life on earth. Like some of these theories uh, which, have, uh, which I am going to explain you in this uh, uh, class are the theory of uh, special creation so let us take these take up these theories one by one so the theory of supernatural or theory of special creation so the theory of supernatural or special creation gives the credit for origin of life to a superpower whom we generally call as god so you can see here this cloud represents heaven And the magical hand which is coming out from the cloud, you know, can be imagined uh, as that of the God. So we do not know how exactly God created life, but like a magician, he one fine day, you know, pulled a rabbit out of his hat. So we, so that tells us that we don't have the details of how exactly did God created life, but certain religious texts, they try to give us an idea of how God made life. For example, if you see uh, the Genesis, uh, which is part of the Bible, that explains how God made life. So, according to Bible, God took uh, seven days 
or six days actually to create uh, uh, the entire universe and life. So on the seventh day, he took rest. So in the beginning, you know, he said he created light and then on the second day, he created sky. Then on the third day, he created land, sea plants, trees, etc. On the fourth day, he created sun, moon, stars. On fifth day, he created creatures that live in sea and also the birds which fly. On the sixth day, he created animals, terrestrial animals, land animals, including man. Now, the creation of man is given a special place in Genesis because it is believed that God has created man in his own image. Okay, but uh, you know, nonetheless, he has made them less powerful. But the appearance of uh, man is said to be, you know, similar to that of the God. So there is reference to such things in religious, te religious texts like Bible. Now, if you look into Hinduism, then we have this uh, creator God, creator God Brahma, who has created all the life on earth. And also the first man and woman on earth. So according to uh, Hinduism, it is uh, Manu and uh, uh, Sh uh, Sharada. So according to Bible uh, uh, and also according to Islam, it is uh, Adam and Eve. So the first man was Adam and the first woman was Eve. So we have all these stories in our religious book. So all that uh, is a part of theory of supernatural creation. Now who proposed this theory of supernatural creation? So it is the father Saures. So father Saures proposed theory of special creation or it is also known as supernatural creation now let us come to the second theory see although uh, uh, the uh, theory of supernatural creation or uh, uh, special creation it tries to understand how life originated on earth uh, but it is uh, not acceptable because it is not scientific since nobody has seen God, uh, his act of creation of life. You know, in science, there is uh, no place for such theories. So as time progressed, you know, people started to observe keenly. And uh, the next theory which they came uh, across was the theory of spontaneous origin of life. So spontaneous means suddenly for example so people you know they started to wonder if you leave a piece of meat exposed to air then it starts to uh, grow maggots on it so ma maggots develop on this piece of meat so they believe that life can originate all of a sudden from things like rotting meat or uh, decaying matter or ro rotting matter and things like straw. So that is theory of spontaneous origin of life. Now, many famous people like Aristotle, he is a student, Plato, And very influential people of uh, you know the old times like uh, von Helmont. So they all believed in this theory of spontaneous origin of life. So today we know that life cannot originate spontaneously. So at the at that time also we were ha we had certain opponents for this theory of spontaneous origin of life. So the opponents uh, were people like Francisco Reddy. They did their best to explain that life does not originate spontaneously. So they did their own experiments to disprove the theory of spontaneous origin of 
life. Now, one such experiment was done by Francisco Reddy. So Francisco Reddy took three jars. He put three meat pieces in these three jars. He left the first jar open, exposed to the air. Then the second jar was covered by a mesh. And the third jar was completely closed, airtight. So what Francisco Reddy was able to tell from his uh, experiment was that if you leave the jar exposed with meat in it, if you leave it exposed, then flies would visit the meat. And while visiting the meat, they would lay eggs there which were not visible to the common people. And from those eggs, the larvae developed. So he tried to say that the larvae that you see have not developed on their own, but uh, they were as a, they formed as a result of the hatching of the eggs which were deposited by these flies when they visited the meat. So he also said that in the second jar, which is closed by the mesh, he showed people the eggs which were dropped by the flies on the mesh. So since flies did not have access to the meat, they laid their eggs on the mesh. So he was able to show eggs also to the believers of theory of spontaneous generation, uh, origin of life. In the third jar, you know, there was uh, also no life in it. But these results of Francisco Reddy were not accepted by the society. The people did not accept his results. Now, the comments they made were, they said that, Francisco Reddy, by closing the mouth of these jars, is preventing some force, vital force, which is necessary for life to enter into the jar, because of which the life is prevented from originating spontaneously. So that is uh, what the comment, uh, you know, made by the believers of spontaneous origin of life in those days. So the next experiment, uh, you know, in this effort to disprove theory of spontaneous origin of life was done by Spallanzani. So Spallanzani, what he did was, he made a soup of plant and, uh, uh, you know, animal matter, which is called as broth. So if you just add few vegetables and pieces of meat and boil it in water, so that is what uh, creates a broth or soup. Now, this broth or soup had all the nutrients to support life. Okay, so in this diagram, it is shown as gravy. So, initially, he made a gravy of all the nutrients, taking plant and animal matter, and then he boiled it. Okay, so why is he boiling it? So, that is called as pre sterilization. So, he is sterilizing or he is making sure that there are no microbes in the broth to begin with. So that is why he is boiling it. So this phenomena is called as sterilization. So sterilization is nothing but wiping out the entire life. So sterilization has a very important application in medical science. So if you are operating on the patient or if you are trying to puncture his skin while inject injecting, you try to clean that area before you operate or inject with a swab of uh, alcohol. So that is sterilization. So when you do so, you are wiping out or killing all the organism, microorganisms which could enter from the incision or from the puncture of the skin. So that is sterilization. So he's making sure that there are no organisms in this broth to begin with. And then he leaves that flask open or exposed to the air. And after a few days, he observes that there are a lot of different types of microorganisms in that gravy or broth. Now, what he also does is, he takes another such flask, he boils the content of the flask, the broth in it, he boils it, and then he covers the mouth of the flask. So, in this second flask which he covered uh, the mouth, there was no microorganism observed in it. Again, people said that you are blocking the air from entering into the flask or some vital force. So that is why organisms have failed to develop spontaneously. So that is what people who believed in the theory of spontaneous origin of life, they commented on Spallanzani's experiment. 
so it is to be observed that these uh, experiments which were meant to disprove uh, theory of uh, spontaneous origin of life mainly uh, were using microorganisms so we have one microbiologist the famous microbiologist louis pasteur so louis pasteur is the father of microbiology so finally he performs this experiment called swan neck experiment So that this is the name of the experiment which was performed by Louis Pasteur. So Louis Pasteur also uses the same microorganisms to disprove the theory of spontaneous origin of life. So this becomes the ultimate theory which finally disproves all the claims made by people who believed in spontaneous origin of life. So what he does was, uh, did was he took a flask similar to Spallanzani's experiment. So there is a lot of similarity between Louis Pasteur's experiment, Swanick experiment, and Spallanzani's experiment. But there is slight modification done by Louis Pasteur. So Louis Pasteur also takes a flask. He adds broth in it, or the nutrient soup, which can support growth of microorganisms. And then he pre-sterilizes the broth in the flask. So this process is called as pre-sterilization so he is trying to remove any microorganisms which could be there in the broth to begin with so that is pre-sterilization and then he cleverly without closing the lid of the flask he cleverly bends the neck of the flask and gives it a swan neck appearance so using a flame it is possible to bend glass and you know twist it so that is what louis pasteur did he did not block the opening instead he simply bent the neck of the flask to give it a swan neck uh, swan neck appearance hence the experiment is also known as swan neck experiment and then he leaves the flask as it is and since the broth was hot the water vapor from this broth condensed in this uh, u-shaped limb of the swan neck so there was water here so this is water jacket so this water jacket prevented any microorganisms from outside to enter into the flask so this is how without closing the opening of the flask by bending the neck of the flask resembling swan neck louis pasteur did not allow microorganisms from outside to enter into the flask now he took uh, another similar flask and he broke the neck of this flask that is he exposed the broth to the outside environment and since it is exposed the microorganisms from outside they entered into the broth and they started to grow inside unlike in case of flask a so in flask a there were no microorganisms or yeast whereas in flask b one could observe growth of East because the mouth was open so this is how louis pasteur using the technique of uh, sterilization as well as using the organism yeast so these the organism yeast is very important here so the name of the organism which was used by louis pasteur in his experiment was yeast so yeast is the organism what he used in his experiment and then he also used the technique of sterilization that is killing all the microorganisms in the given medium so this is how louis pasteur said that life originates only from pre-existing life so there was there were spores outside the flask in the air so these spores entered the flask and then using the nutrients in the broth they grew into 
yeast cells. Whereas in the flask A, remember he did not uh, close the opening of the flask. The opening is still open, but the water jacket in flask A did not allow any microorganisms to enter inside. As a result, there was no yeast in flask A, whereas there was yeast in flask A. B. So this is how very cleverly by modifying Spallanzani's experiment, Louis Pasteur disproved the theory of spontaneous origin of life or theory of spontaneous generation of life once for all. Now what is uh, abiogenesis and biogenesis? So biogenesis is nothing but the idea that life originates from pre-existing life. So which is nothing but the opposite of abiogenesis. Now what does abiogenesis tell us? So abiogenesis is uh, uh, what people believed in case of the spontaneous origin of life. So from non-living substances like from rotting matter or straw, you know, all of a sudden there is appearance of life. So abiogenesis is origin of life from non-living or uh, rotting matter and straw. So that is what is abiogenesis. So abiogenesis is what is the, uh, the idea behind the theory of spontaneous origin of life. Now, there are certain examples, uh, you know, what people believed in, uh, in case of the spontaneous origin of life. Like uh, uh, many Greeks, uh, sorry, not Greeks, many Egyptians believed in this idea of spontaneous origin of life. So they believed that whenever it rains, you know, all of a sudden they could see frogs and, uh, you know, other uh, uh, creatures coming out from the uh, Nile River, which had, you know, dried in summer. So today we know, you know, it is because of... Uh, Estivation of frogs. So frogs are there in the seabed, hidden in deep burrows. So whenever it rains and the water floods the river bed, so the frogs come out of their estivation or summer sleep and they start making croaking sound, which is a mating call, you know, to increase their number. So that is what we know today. But earlier uh, Egyptians, you know, they believed uh, uh, in things like this, and so they were also a believer of spontaneous origin of life. Now a person called Von Helmut, who is also a believer of spontaneous origin of life. So he said that he used to claim that if you give him a cloth soaked with sweat and few wheat grains, he can produce a mice, live mice out of it. So he would wrap these wheat grains in this uh, uh, cloth with sweat. And then if he places it in one corner of the room after a few days he can observe mice in it so what he did not know was there was mice already around in the room so that mice uh, with the smell of tracking the smell of uh, sweat it came to the cloth and then when it found the wheat grains it started feeding on it and made it its home so that is how the mice appeared in uh, the sweat soaken cloth with few Wheat grains. But these are some of the uh, examples of spontaneous origin of life what people believed long time ago. Now coming to the third theory which is theory of panspermia. So theory of panspermia was proposed by
Richter. So Richter proposed the theory of panspermia. So this is this was also believed to be one of the theories of origin of life by ancient Greeks. So ancient Greeks also believed in this theory and even today. So this theory is popular with astronomers. Now let us see what is theory of panspermia. Now before that theory of panspermia is also known as theory of cosmozoia. So, theory of panspermia is also known as cosmozoic theory. Now, what is the, the theory of panspermia or cosmozoic theory tells us? So, it says that life came to earth from outer space so that is what is the basis or principle of theory of panspermia so there is there was life in some part of the universe so that came to earth now how did it come to earth so if you see on a clear sky at night you can see some objects falling towards the bright shiny objects falling towards the sky many believe that they are stars they are not stars like you can see them here on the screen they are actually stone like structures relatively big stone like structures some of them stretching up to you know few kilometers uh, long so such boulders or stones are called as meteorites so these are meteorites which when traveling towards the earth you know when they come very close to the earth they get pulled by earth gravitational force and when they enter Earth's atmosphere, due to friction, they catch fire, they become hot and they glow while falling towards the sky. Now, some of the meteorites could survive this journey through Earth's atmosphere. So, if they are relatively big, then while traveling through Earth's atmosphere, they generally shrink in size because they are burning, they would turn into ash. But if the meteorite is very big to begin with, then it can survive this journey through the earth's atmosphere. And by the time it falls to the earth, you know, it can still be of considerable size. So there are many such sites on earth where you can see the impact craters made by such meteorites in the past. So if you see here, this is one such crater called Beringer Crater, which is in Arizona of United States. So the diameter of this crater is uh, about uh, you know one kilometer, one kilometer plus in diameter. So such meteorites have been hitting Earth from the past. So these are all evidences that Earth is uh, a witness to many meteorites in the past. Now some of the pieces of meteorites, when they were analyzed by scientists, they have found fossils of microorganisms as you can see here so this is a fragment of a particular meteorite called ALH84001 so when they took the electron uh, 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 microscopic pictures of these uh, pieces of meteorites scientists have been able to find fossils of possible microorganisms in these meteorites so all these uh, evidences support the fact that life could have existed in some corner of the universe and it would have accidentally come and fallen on earth with the help of these meteorites now the main objection to the theory of panspermia is that how can living organisms survive the hostile conditions of space so if you see space it is very dark there is no sunlight so there can't be even photosynthesis so how can an organism travel space for such a long time in dark and space is also very cold and if at all it is coming to earth through these meteorites then how can it survive the very 
heat which is produced by the burning of the meteorite during its journey through the earth's atmosphere so many people believe that although the meteorite uh, uh, burns while entering into the earth atmosphere if it is very big then the inner core you know may not get as hot as uh, you know the outer part of the meteorite uh, uh, gets so because of that some microorganisms can survive in the very deep inside of the meteorite and this is how they would have landed on the earth and even if the meteorite gets uh, hot it is believed that the microorganisms which have traveled through these meteorites are in the form of spores so we all know spores are very resistant structures so if at all microorganisms or life in any form has come to earth in the form of spores then there are all chances that it would survive the harsh uh, conditions of the space as well as the harsh conditions that uh, uh, it has to uh, withstand while uh, entering into the earth's atmosphere on the meteorite now in addition to this uh, scientists have also found certain microorganisms which are exclusively found to grow well on the contents of meteorites so one such bacteria is uh, metallosperia sedula so this metallosperia sedula people have found that it grows very well on the contents of uh, meteorites rather than on uh, any other rock which is found on the earth so we have already found microorganisms which are specialized to grow on these meteorites so things like these are evidence for the fact that life would have come to earth from outer space 